Hello, everyone. I am Patrick Smith, and I'd like to welcome you to the West Virginia Cybersecurity Expo, here jointly being done with the West Virginia Game Developers Expo. Uh, I have two amazing sponsors to bring up here that couldn't have made this happen without them. Uh, one is Remake West Virginia, who is a local uh, nonprofit who is an Epic Game Mega Grant recipient, and the second one being Mount West Community Technical College. Today, we are honored here to have Danielle Cox, who is a Chief Information Security Officer with West Virginia's Office of Technology here uh, to be our keynote speaker in, in here in the cybersecurity track. So welcome, Danielle. Thank you so much for this, and uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Patrick. It's really great to be here today uh, talking to everybody about cybersecurity. It's a passion. Obviously, it's my career. I have been working for the state of West Virginia in a cybersecurity position for almost 10 years now. Um, I've always been interested in cybersecurity, earned my CISSP, and did it all here in the state of West Virginia. And that's something I'm very proud of. Uh, so today I want to talk to you about cybersecurity within the state government of West Virginia and how we impact those around us and in the, the communities that we work. Why do we have a cybersecurity office? Uh, a lot of people don't realize that cybersecurity within state government is a very growing area, that there are a lot of uh, great opportunities within state government and even local government when it comes to cybersecurity what our threat landscape looks like, some of the areas that we are dealing with that are specific to state government. Some of them might carry over into private sector as well. Uh, what are the challenges that we're facing here in the cyber industry and in government? And then I wanna talk about cyber careers, how you can get into cybersecurity, you know, what you need to know before you get a career in cybersecurity, and then what would a conference in 2020 be without addressing how things have changed this year um, and how they've changed for the, uh, the positive when it comes to getting a cybersecurity career. Okay, so one of the things, why do we have a cybersecurity office? And that's a simple answer. Uh, the cost of cybercrime right now is astronomical, and it's only projected to increase. Ransomware is still projected to grow and impact industries. And state government has all of your data. It's one thing when you get to choose an organization, a private sector business, to give your money to or you know, give your business to. As a state entity, you have to deal with the organizations. You have to deal with the Department of Tax. You have to deal with um, the rules and the laws that the state implements. And so because of that, we need to make sure we're protecting citizen data. Uh, we have in state government under my authority right now, we have about 35,000 endpoints. We protect 2,500 servers and over 30,000 employees. Every day we see over a million, over 3 million threats. And, you know, those are huge numbers and we still have a relatively small team. And one of the issues I'm gonna talk about later in this presentation is filling those team positions there are a ton of available security jobs and we don't have qualified candidates to fill them yet. So if you're just beginning your IT career or you're already in IT and you wanna go a different direction, cybersecurity is really an up and coming field that you need to look at. Now, specifically for my office and what we do within the state of West Virginia, we kind of have three areas we look at. We look at state government as a whole, how we support state government missions. So how we support, securely support uh, agencies like human resources or Department of Environmental Protection. 
you know, they have their own individual missions as an organization, and we need to ensure that they can complete those missions securely. And then we look at critical infrastructure. West Virginia is a consolidated state government, which means most of the agencies in the executive branch are, you know, report directly to the governor. They have one overseeing IT infrastructure, an overseeing purchasing office. So you share these resources and it's a little more efficient and economic, economical when you're making procurements or you're looking at buying something or implementing certain IT systems. So we're responsible for making sure that those critical infrastructures, those critical pieces of our IT systems are secure. And then another area we really focus on is cyber workforce. Um, my boss and myself are constantly involved in trying to get people coming out of college and vocational schools into our industry because they are the lifeblood and we need those different set of eyes coming in to our organization and helping us grow and secure everything. So we focus a lot of time on cyber workforce. We have an internship program that we run out of our cybersecurity office. We hire anywhere between four and six, right around that number, interns a year um, to work mostly during the summer, but it does carry over into the fall and the winter. And those interns get to experience a wide range of cyber areas because our house is a full service shop. And I'll talk a little bit more about what each of those shops are, but we do a lot of different work. And so these interns come in, they work with us for three or four months. Most of them do come back the next year or two um, if available. And we have really good turnout for our interns. A lot of our interns have went off to uh, the FBI, ICE. Uh, many have been invited to Las Vegas to do security there. Uh, Florida, a lot of private sector businesses. So we've really devoted a lot of time and effort into establishing that cyber workforce. And then the four areas that we focus on within those primary three divisions are the risk, our cyber risk, what outreach, whether it's internal or doing presentations like this and reaching out into community and prospective students, um, you know, where we're at when it comes to cyber protection and cyber operations, which is our day to day security. And so we kind of task all of our, our working um, activities into these categories. If it's outside of one of these categories, it's usually considered a lower priority. So at a minimum, the three things that my office does is we set to establish cybersecurity as a critical issue within agencies and state governments. And here's one that a lot of people forget about. Cybersecurity is a technical issue, but it's also a business issue. If the person holding the purse strings doesn't think that a particular cyber tool is important, your security is going to suffer. So it's important that business is heavily involved and the administrators that are making policy decision and financial decisions are involved in cybersecurity decisions as well. So that's, it's critical that we get both sides of the house involved in these decisions. And then cyber risk management is the approach that the state of West Virginia takes. One of my favorite examples, I steal from my boss all the time. When trying to explain cyber risk to people just coming into the industry or to business personnel that don't know anything about IT in general. 
when you're talking about cyber risk, you want to defend as best you can within the resources you have. Nobody would ever come up to you and say, hey, I need you to make my business fireproof. That would cost an arm and a leg if it was even possible. What you do, though, is you set mechanisms in place that you can't afford that address your highest level risk. So you put things like sprinklers in certain areas or fire suppression systems that are waterless in other areas because you don't want your IT equipment damaged. You put fire extinguishers out. Um, so that same principle applies when we're dealing with cybersecurity. The big difference in state government, though, is your expectation versus reality. So most people, a ton of people, have Gmail accounts, free email accounts from Google or whatever provider you choose to use. That's a great service and it's free. The reality in government is your, your uh, budget is, is not nearly as expansive as Google. And so you have to make do with a, a lot less. The other issue that we have when we deal with state government is all this undocumented shared risk. So you'll have within state government, you might have an office that shares information with another department that shares information down to county levels that shares it down with schools. So you have this unofficial network of reliances. So if one of the chain goes down, it impacts the rest. And you have to be aware of those interconnections. Um, you know, if some state system goes down, does it impact every single county? In some situations, yes. Um, education is a, a prime example of that. There's a state board of education that provides services to each of the counties. And if those state systems were to go down, the counties could suffer from it. Um, so it's really important to map out in an organization where all those interconnections are. And once you have those interconnections, you need to provide defense in depth. This is a term that if you've spent any amount of time in the security realm, you've heard. A, a lot of people really don't understand what it means, but basically at every level of the process, like every level of the computer system, um, you wanna provide appropriate levels of defense um, from the physical, from your policies and procedures to how that data is being transmitted to how that system's being used. You want to figure out the protection mechanisms you need on your internal network, on the device itself, on the application, and on the data. Um, each of these areas has a control or a bunch of controls that you can apply to help protect them. You know, data exfiltration is, is very popular in some areas, and so you need to make sure that data is not leaving your network uh, without your permission. But even if you know everything, even if you put all your controls in place, uh, we still have incidents. And now my team specifically, we have a love-hate relationship with incidents. Incidents happen at different scales all the time. Uh, big incidents would be like ransomware outbreaks or you found a major vulnerability in a system that's been publicly facing and you need to investigate how long it's it's been out there and who's had access to it. It's not a good day when somebody has incidents, but the cybersecurity office usually enjoys working the incidents because this is when you kind of put all your skills to the test, you're trying to fix things. Um, it, it, it's, a fun, it's a fun time. You have a bunch of nerds that are really good at what they do. And now they've got resources, time and attention to make change and to fix things. So it's kind of exciting when you get incident, you just hope it's not a horribly bad incident that's gonna you know, result in your entire office being replaced. 
So yeah, we have a love-hate relationship with incidents. No matter the incident though, one of the main things we have to do is we have to learn from the mistakes so you don't repeat them again. And that's why um, when we go through an incident, we do try to document and do lessons learned after each incident. Now, one of the things with the cybersecurity office is you, you don't know what you don't know. And so a lot of the work that you're doing or my office is doing is you're preparing for a response and you're not 100% sure what the issue is going to be. Um, so it's, it's a lot of uncertainty. It is a lot of fun uh, to a certain extent kind of dealing with a wide range of issues and topics and possibilities, but that's what we do. Now, what are we up against? We're up against everything private sector is up against. Um, we are outnumbered, uh, underfunded, funded, and stretched thin. You know, we have currently nine people, including myself, on our team. And we're, you know, we're still looking to hire a couple more. But if you're doing an, in, if you have an internal house, your team's usually pretty small, um, unless you're outsourcing everything, which some governments do choose to do. If local governments are lucky, they might have one person that has security as a side job, basically. It's an extra duty or duty as assigned is security. Um, so we're really lucky here at the state that leadership is recognized uh, that we are up against a lot and that we need to devote the time and resources to address those issues. Now, when we talk about cybersecurity, you will never get through a uh, book discussion without talking about confidentiality, available, availability, and integrity. Uh, so we do tend to think in threes. The CIA triad is you know, core cybersecurity. What we also do, though, is we also think in people, process, and technology. Because those three things impact our security. And they do so on this 90-10 rate. 10% of what we do is technical controls. The other 90% is the people and process. It's how and what they're doing with the technology or the data. This can often be overlooked if you're in a very heavily technical area. Uh, policies and processes and how people are trained is, is crucial. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the phishing campaigns that we see on a regular basis, but you know, the 10% of security safeguards are not the part that keeps me up at night. Usually it's the other 90%, the people and the processes and how things are being done that worries me the most. Now, as a government entity, we still deal with all of the standard bad guys or bad actors, as we typically call them. Um, you know, hackers and malware writers and cyber scammers. We have cyber terrorist activities that we have to deal with. Um, so anything you hear in the news, we're probably dealing with on a regular basis. The reason it's important to governments is the costs associated with the breach. It goes up every single year, um, about eight years ago, South Carolina was probably one of the first states that really had a, a bad ransomware outbreak or a data loss. And it cost them over $20 million. It got most of the security staff replaced at that time, unfortunately. And then they followed up the following year was with targets. And then recently, or more recently, was Equifax. Now, the reason I even list these, because there are a few years ago, is that each one of these organizations are still dealing with the outcome 
of those major breaches. Uh, it wasn't like a one and done thing. You know, Equifax is still estimated to spend, I think, an extra $100 million this year dealing with the, a breach that they've already spent $1.4 billion on. Uh, so yeah, it keeps going. And state governments are, or government entities in general, are, are pretty well targeted. Uh, one of the things that we make sure we tell interns when they're making a decision between interning in private sector or interning in the government sector is you will see attacks at the government level five times the amount you will see in private sector. You can, in some industries in the private sector, you can go most of your career without seeing a major attack or a major attempt on your network. If you're in any type of government entity, uh, you will not be that lucky. Uh, governments are, you know, easy targets. They know, uh, bad actors know that we have a ton of citizen data. Uh, we have a lot of red tape. We have not the best budgets when it comes to IT. I think on average, Gardner did a report a couple years ago, or back in 2018, 2019, uh, that the average cyber spend for government budgets was less than two and a half percent. So out of a whole IT budget, two and a half percent was de dedicated to cybersecurity. That's, that's not a lot. Um, so yeah, we're, we're pretty much sitting ducks and states and counties and cities have suffered for it. You know, we've talked about South Carolina, South Carolina was kind of like the first major breach with governments. And then we had city of Atlanta. They had issues when they're, when they got, uh, hit with ransomware they couldn't keep their emergency services up and functioning. I mean, you're not talking money at that point. You're talking life and limb services. And then Colorado, more recently, they had an attack and they had to take all of their DMV processes back to pen and paper. You think DMV is slow when you're still doing things on a computer. Can you imagine the workload and the time that people had to deal with? when they were back using pen and paper. Um, so yeah, governments see a lot uh, and we deal with a lot. You know, and we have, for the most part, one of the issues is we live in digital America. Everybody has uh, devices now. Everybody has social medias. They have mobile subscriptions. Um, they're all, everybody's on the internet. We've seen during COVID, you know, most of, at least in West Virginia, a lot of our schools are doing remote schooling. Uh, so everybody is connected to the internet and it makes uh, attacks a lot easier. Especially when you add in IoT devices. Internet of Thing devices is by far one of the areas which is just absolutely terrifying. Uh, I have a, a neighbor and for at least six months, they did not secure their refrigerator. Like I could go and add items to the refrigerator list. Um, until finally, you know, they were like, you know, maybe you could come and secure this for us. Cause you know, you need to quit ask, adding your diet Dr. Pepper to your, to our shopping list. Um, I could see in their refrigerator. It's insane. Uh, for governments or for major businesses, HVAC units always, always surprise me. You can almost guarantee if you have an HVAC, the passwords have been, the passwords were default um, in large installations. And then it comes down. I mean, everything has a vulnerability. Now, fortunately, I don't see any of these in the state government. I'd be a little concerned if I did. Um, but everything's vulnerable now. 
because everything's got some kind of connection components. Now, areas we do see in state government, we see a ton of wireless speaker systems, which, you know, on the surface, that might not be a big issue. Okay, they hear me talk, I'm not saying anything. Well, in, in government or in business, those conversations can be really critical and need to be kept confidential. Um, so wireless speaker systems with major vulnerabilities are an issue. Thermostats, we have seen thermostats used uh, incorrectly. You think your office is hot or cold, somebody gets into your thermostat and cranks up your building's uh, cooler system, cooling system, or turns it down, you can shut down a business by it overheating. If you leave your data center um, air conditioning unit vulnerable and somebody turns off your data center cooling system, you know, your whole data center is going to go down. It's going to overheat. So we still have, um, you know, domestic robots, wireless systems. You see a lot of the domestic robots now, or at least in 2020, are, are thermostats or thermometers for taking temperatures of people now. In some areas, you'll have uh, little robots that troll around for temperatures and take people's temperatures. Um, so and then you have the door locks, refrigerators, laundry machines, water detector, you name it, it's connected. And like I said, most of them, when people set them up, they, they put default passwords on them. Uh, they don't go in there and change the default passwords. And this applies to business as well as individuals. Um, so something that simple can cause a whole lot of issue. Uh, we have, like in state government, we have refrigerators that have digital monitoring because maybe they're keeping like lab samplers or something at a certain temperature. And so if you mess with those, that could result in incorrect lab readings or failed tests and the outcome to that is, is, is scary when people are relying on test results. Now, when it comes to challenges, what, what are we seeing? Like, what are we actually seeing on a day-to-day -day basis? So we have quite a bit of um, your typical, typical areas, you know, adware is more of an annoyance than a, a real security concern. We still get uh, computer viruses, Trojans, worms, um, spyware rootkits, all this typical malware. And then you get key loggers, which is horrifying depending on what segment of government you're in and what exactly you're typing, whether it's passwords or very sensitive data. And then we get scareware and spear phishing. Ransomware seems to be the, you know, the cream of the crop scare factor. You know, when you get ransomware and it's propagated throughout your entire network, um, that's, that's when you're not having a bad day. You're not having a bad week. You're having a series of bad months, maybe even a year or more. Um, there have been government organizations that have, gotten ransomware and two years later they are still fully recovering from it. Um, we've had a couple incidents here that are public, publicly not um, the public so I, I'm fine talking about them but we've had a couple school districts that have been hit by ransomware. There's been some hospitals. Um, a couple of those incidents my office has assisted um, in trying to get them set back up or helping them manage their incident. But it's, it's a ton of extra work. It's a ton of extra hours. Um, it's definitely something that you want to stay on top of. And there are tools and solutions that we have implemented that help uh, limit that exposure. We're going to talk a little bit about some of those. Um, now, some people, I have a couple of illustrations here 
um, when we're talking about botnets, um, essentially your computer can be taken over and then used with other computers to attack a certain victim. So that's what botnets are. That's what we're looking at when we talk about botnets. Um, and then rootkits, essentially, it's basically a, a collection of programs that you can use that the attacker can use, the bad actor can use to get administrative access at the main level of your computer. So it's basically as far as it gets down into, and then it has full control of your computer and it can basically do whatever they want. The one that's been very popular this year is social engineering techniques. Oh, we see social engineering techniques every single day. Uh, shoulder surfing is not as common in our industry, although I think last time I was doing an in-person presentation, I was like looking at the crowd milling about before the presentation over the balcony. And like, there was like a whole line of people that were just directly below me typing in all their passwords to get into their computers and stuff. And then they later left those computers on the tables. Um, so shoulder surfing still is a risk. Um, you see it a lot when there's crowds of people or people are just kind of being lackadaisical. Dumpster diving. Uh, this is <laughs> this is oddly successful. <laughs> people throw away a lot of stuff they probably shouldn't without shredding it. And so we have seen uh, people getting in dumpsters and pulling out you know stacks of data that somebody might inadvertently throw out or purposely throw out and because they don't want to run it through the shredder. Uh, scams, reverse social engineering, surfing online content, free stuff. One of the things with scams, we have phishing, vishing, smishing. So you have voice scams, which I have yet to get one of these voice scams where Microsoft or some other quote, IT company apparently calls you and tells you that you have a virus and they need to, to help you. Um, most major tech companies do not care as you as an individual and they're not going to call you. Unfortunately, a lot of these scams target are over 70 uh, citizens and they did not grow up with the IT uh, inundation that a lot of us did. And so you get a ton of senior citizens that are getting taken advantage of via phone calls and phishing and text message scams as well. So with the phishing, phishing by far is one of those things that seems so simple, yet so annoying to deal with. Um, you know, a user a scammer sets up a fake website, steals credentials or steals other types of data is usually our two options. Right now, I know this comes as a surprise, but COVID scams are still really popular. Uh, one of the phishing campaigns that we saw right at the beginning of COVID was uh, offering free masks offering discounted masks and cleaning supplies and people fell for it left and right, handed over their credentials. Uh, usually if you're not an administrative account and you're just a standard user and you hand over your credentials, your account is then used to spam other people, which is uh, time consuming and annoying to deal with because then you get this, oh, look, it's a phishing email. And then somebody else sends you, oh, I got this phishing email. So not only are you handling the users that got compromised, but you're also handling the users that are freaking out because other users potentially got compromised. It's just, it's not a fun day to deal with phishing scams. Um, and because they go to every user, um, you know, when you have 25,000 users, it's a lot of emails. It's it's a lot to deal with. 
unfortunately for most government employees, your email address, your phone number for your work is publicly available. Um, we know we can't hide that. We can't restrict access to that information. So it's, it's, it's out there. And then there's the physical aspect of your IT equipment. Uh, people, for some reason, love to leave devices in unlocked vehicles, in coffee shops. I don't know how many times I've been to, well, before COVID, I've been to a coffee shop and people just leave their laptop up, logged in, connected to their employer's VPN, and then go to the bathroom or go to mix up some stuff in their coffee. And they just leave their device there. I mean, you could literally walk out with their device and they would never know. Um, so yeah, this is still a threat, the physical theft of it. It happens in airports, hotels. I see it all the time in libraries. And then when we have those fun end users, uh, thumb drives. So we have a policy in a lot of our agencies. We actually turn off your USB drive. I don't want people plugging in their, their phones to the computer to charge it. I don't want people putting in thumb drives to, you know, copy an entire database onto it. Um, you have to deal with that because when we have, when we talk about having data, I mean, we have a ton of data and we don't want it going anywhere. We get things mailed to us. We get stuff put on portable hard drives. All these are areas that we have to be aware of and have a plan for. Now, when I talk about getting into security, I, I want to talk about my team specifically, just to give you an idea of what's what the skill sets are, where everybody comes from. So like my, myself, I started at a law firm when I was 16 years old and I did a lot of end user training. I was the training coordinator and I helped do a bunch of like orientations. Here's how you get the best out of your computer. I was simultaneously working on programming and did a lot of uh, web applications and websites. So that was my background before I worked on getting my uh, master's degree in technology management and my CISSP. So I did not start in the cybersecurity realm. I didn't start in the cybersecurity realm because when I started, there was no cybersecurity realm. <laughs> cybersecurity uh, wasn't even a thought for most people, you know, back in 2005, 2006. Now, the team itself has a lot of diverse experience. Um, our forensic and investigations guy, he's actually a first responder with IT knowledge, and he's been trained up and um, provided the skills and the training that he needs to perform his tasks. In our cyber risk area, um, we have one of our staff members who is over top of that area. He was actually a field tech. Uh, he was also um, worked at a casino and did physical surveillance and security. So that was his background. One of our knowledge managers who organizes all of our data for us and makes sure that, you know, we understand what system has which data. She is a ex service desk member that did password resets and let's see all of our firewall guys they mostly have networking experience um our endpoint guy who does our endpoint detection he has pretty much always done endpoint stuff i think he used to work at the service desk but basically all the personnel started with a fundamental solid understanding of IT. And, and that's the critical parts is having that base understanding of how IT works, um, how the different 
layers work, how they connect, and then branching off. And when I say branching off, I mean branching off. So a lot of people, when they hear the word cybersecurity, they think they're hacking something, they're doing penetration testing, um, and that's pretty much all there is to it. Or you're staring at monitoring software and then preparing to defend against an attack. There's so much more and so, so much available out there in the cybersecurity realm. Um, there are some domains that kind of break it out. Um, my team does cover each of those domains, which is what I referred to earlier as a, you know, a full shop. We do have security operations where we monitor day-to-day -day functions. We have a baseline and when things get a little wonky and our, our baseline, there's been a change to our baseline. That's when security operations steps in, figures out what's going on. If it's, if it's a new attack, if it's something getting through, um, and then we address it. And that's also where our incident response capabilities lie. That team is the first one to start tracking down any incident response. We also have a vulnerability management program. That vulnerability management program is, um, you know, we scan every single device on the network at least once a month and track any vulnerabilities associated with those devices and how long it takes us to patch, which devices are at more risk than others. Um, and do we see anything that we need to step in and address? You know, things like um, flash going out of support, flash needing uninstalled, we monitor and we keep track of all that, all these different changes, um, you know, making sure you're not using Java so that falls under the vulnerability management program. And then you have career development and user education. And this is for those people that are, you know, people focused and maybe not super, super technical, but they have the skills to develop employees or to train employees or other staff. So there's a, there's a role there for that. Um, you know, this is kind of where I started my career was in that user education realm. There's threat intelligence, uh, where you are looking at the upcoming, th the, the trending threats and you're analyzing what's likely to impact your organization. We do the governance, which is all your laws, regulations, your audits, your, um, any of your policies, your guidelines compliance, government has to abide by so many compliance regulations. Uh, tax data has to get audited by the IRS. You know how you get a financial audit? Well, if you're involved with federal tax information, your IT system that handles it, it gets audited too. Um, and it's equally as awful for us to get audited as it is for you individually to get audited financially. Um, the IRS physically comes in at least every three years and goes over everything with a fine tooth comb and then writes you up and tells you what you need to fix. It's great fun. We also have CJIS, which is criminal justice information. We have uh, HIPAA data. We have data from CMS. So there's, there's a ton of government re reliances or regulations. And then you have the security architecture, architecture and engineering area. And so I've got a couple slots here to kind of show you a career path option. So say you want to get into the security engineering level. So you might be involved in some kind of intelligence role. Well, then you can go to something that's specialized in cybersecurity. You would then move up to your, your next level, which might be penetration tests and vulnerability scanning. And then, you know, your advanced level role would be an engineer trying to engineer 
um, that information from where you started, that security intelligence, doing something with it and engineering a solution around that intelligence. Or you might be really involved in the financial sector or doing analysis of risk. And so you would move into looking into getting an auditor position. And then your next step would most likely be like a cybersecurity consultant. And then you would move up into cybersecurity architecture where you're doing high level uh, decisions for an organization. So there's a lot of different ways you can move around in cybersecurity. It is never boring. It is never stale. Um, one of the things you do need to be aware of, especially those of you that are just getting into a career, um, you do need to make sure you don't do things that are inappropriate and like post them and do social media. A lot of cybersecurity jobs require some kind of clearance, especially when you're working with government. And if you are doing certain illegal things, posting certain things, uh, it will come back to bite you. So you need to make sure you are managing your cyber security uh, or your social presence. Because when you're getting hired in cybersecurity, there are other quote unquote nerds looking at you and they're going to they're going to do their due diligence and make sure they know everything about you before they hire you onto the team. Um, so do keep that in mind. Um, I've seen quite a few people that we've passed on just because of their, their social presence is um, not in line with how we perform our jobs. So. Now, what would a talk in the year 2020 be if we didn't talk about how things have changed? And I was showing Patrick this yesterday actually, um, or day before yesterday. So we talked about baselines. Baselines are really important in cybersecurity. That's your, your good baseline. You know what things look like at any given point. I know, you know how much network traffic I should typically see at any given hour. I know where all my devices are. So before COVID, this is one of our baselines. This is a map of West Virginia, and the dots on it represent uh, points of IT equipment. This is basically where a lot of our computer equipment sits. We have tracking software on all of our devices and can physically track it. And you will, if you overlaid this map with a map of uh, state locations, you would, you would see a correlation. You would see DHHR offices or DEP locations. The large circle on top of Charleston, obviously, is the capital. There's, you know, a few thousand employees there, which is great. So that's your normal baseline. Well, in 2020, uh, on March 16th, the Governor Justice issued his uh, Safer at Home order, which was his first order. By April, our baseline went from this to this. So this is now our physical layout. This is where all of our devices are. You have people that have holed up at other locations. You've had vendors that have gone home to other states, other cities. Um, and then you now have all this equipment at home. So it radically changes what you do and how you protect in a cyber world. You know, typically, governments and organizations have put a lot of time and money into defending their network. They've put a lot of effort into defending that physical structure that's on the Capitol ground or at their primary headquarters, if it's a private business. Now all these devices are out in John Doe's, you know, back shed with his, you know, fold out lawn chair as an office desk. Um, so it changes how things have, have worked. You know, it's a, West Virginia implemented a different VPN system um, to handle the load and it lets us have a lot more features. We have 
the ability to have you know, always on VPN. So after work, people can't necessarily take that laptop and then use it for gaming purposes. Um, you know, we had to ensure that our patching for our updates was getting pushed out over the internet to all these devices where normally you would just push it out over the network um, on your standard patching scheme. So COVID has drastically changed the way we protect our assets and every IT organization has felt that impact. Um, I know when COVID first started hitting the US in March and April, you know, it was a massive undertaking. You know, there was a laptop shortage. You, it was hard to buy laptops in the world. Uh, and it wasn't just a West Virginia thing. I mean, it was worldwide. Uh, headsets, desks, there were, you couldn't buy desks. So organizations are definitely adjusting to it and it is creating more IT positions. And as a result, it's creating more cyber positions. Um, and now a lot of these positions are work from home or remote work locations. So it's giving people the opportunity that might live in West Virginia and have connections here in the tri-state area um, to work for larger organizations, organizations like Amazon or Google, where you would primarily need to move to be part of those organizations. You can now do it here in West Virginia, um, which in turn means it's harder for governments to keep their employees because it's hard to compete with those salaries. Um, but overall, it's good for the industry. So that's pretty much what we do and how we do it and what we're dealing with on a regular basis. Are there questions? Hello, Patrick. Hey, I just want to go ahead and jump back in the stream here with uh, Scott as well. Let me do it like this. Hi, Scott. Yeah. You're muted there, sir, in case you got a question. But I, I took some notes here when you were talking uh, so that I could tell you and also potentially throw out there to people listening on the screen or watching this later. You were talking about the whole um, people calling up and saying that, you know, there's bad packets being sent from your Microsoft machine. I have gotten that particular phone call, and I shut them down pretty easy by telling them that I have a Mac, which I do, but even if I didn't, I would not. I'm very upset. In my entire career, I have never got one of those calls. Well, the other thing I will say is um, if you're not aware of the podcast Reply All, it's an excellent podcast about all things technology-based, and they did a whole two-part two deep dive where uh, th these guys basically cut their teeth, I believe, at um, This American Life. So it's, it's really high-quality podcasting. But one of them got one of those calls and then decided to let the person – take over a bad machine just to see what would happen. And then he starts tracing the company and tracing the calls, find out it's in India, goes to India, tries to figure out, you know, do some investigative journalism. It's a very cool, it's, it's a, called Long Distance Part 1 and Long Distance Part 2. But yeah, Reply All, amazing podcast out there that really fascinating that digs more into that. Um, I also know you were talking about how when people leave backpacks and stuff in their cars, I remember maybe 2008-ish when I first started working from out west. I believe there was an incident where a state employee had left a laptop that had PEIA information on it, and then that had gotten stolen out of a, uh, someone's yeah. car, their car. And then based on that, I think we all got some, you know, uh, identity theft yeah. protection for a couple years. So, yeah, it, it happens, uh, especially if you allow BYOD, where suddenly you're putting your you're putting your you're allowing them to bring their own device because you don't want to buy a government device for them or a company device. And then it's the weird power struggle of what corporate or you know company information you allow them to have on the device and how much security can you ask them to legitimately put on a device they own. Um, yeah, COVID has brought all those those topics to bear <laughs> this year. Um, you know, the BYOD, even down to a lot of people, depending on their internet bandwidth uh, or their internet service provider capabilities, they have capped internet. And so we have all these people working from home now. And it's yeah. like, are we paying for that? If we pay for that, how are we making sure that 
they're not using it for their personal use. It, yeah, it's been, it's been a lovely mess to deal with. Um, uh, Daniel, and, uh -huh. yeah, go ahead. We, we, we've got a question from Bazoo Studios there that says, where would one go in West Virginia to find a tech-based job? Uh, I live in a small town, not very technically advanced. Internet is scarce, but I'm pretty good at programming. So uh, the state of West Virginia actually hires in all 55 counties. Uh, we have filled positions throughout the estate. Uh, so that's that's one area. And we also have uh, a lot of organizations that are in Charleston. However, they allow for remote work. Um, so like N4 mm -hmm. is a company that has recently uh, came up in Charleston and, you know, they have great salaries. I've lost one employee to them. Fortunately, two other employees haven't left me yet. But, you know, entry level, they're offering one hundred and twenty five grand in West Virginia. Wow. Hey, government, government can't compete against that, I'll be honest. Um, hmm. Yeah. And they have well, great benefits too. Like they don't have a cap on their PTO, their paid time off. You can take as much paid time off as you want, as long as you get the job done. Yeah. So I don't mean, I don't mean well, to put you on the spot. Oh, sorry. I, I don't want to check. I don't mean to put you on the spot here, but when you showed your chart, I thought you may have known your different locations. I believe he may be in Wetzel County. So do you know of things in that general area based on your spots that could be local locations? So for, if you go to like, when we're talking government stuff, mm -hmm. um, yeah. I know some of the counties around Wetzel, uh, the major cities in those counties all have IT programs. There's actually contractors too out in that area. Um, if you look on the state government website for the West Virginia's website for positions, you can actually mark that you're in that area mm -hmm. and um, get job related to that area. Um, awesome. Like OT, our, our office OT, we hire in all 55 counties. Um, so, and we are looking at expanding things like cybersecurity. We have a large application development team, like a huge application development team. And we are looking at expanding those offers to people that aren't necessarily in Charleston or can drive to Charleston. Thanks to COVID. Could you give us an idea if you know, if you don't, that's fine. But like roughly what minimum requirements they're looking for, for those people at this point. So for cybersecurity, cybersecurity's entry level positions are pretty high. It is one of the more niche um, positions. You need to have at least five solid years of IT experience. Uh, I do not require that it be in cybersecurity. Um, you know, one of my next positions probably will be an application or a programmer type person um, because a lot of the open source tools that we can take advantage of require regular programming uh, to tweak and modify to get the best out of it. So, yeah, we are looking at possibly hiring an application person. Were you, do I remember correctly, were you telling me probably Python? Somebody was telling me that Python is gigantic right now in security. So I'm just. Some of the open source tools use Python, yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, there's there's a lot of different tools and they use a lot of different languages. So. Um, okay. Well, the so other Danielle, comment. Um, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I, good. Your office, is, is that what used to be ISNC? Yeah, back before 2006. Yeah, in 2006, the state government consolidated and it became Office of Technology. Okay. I, I used to work for a vendor and, mm -hmm. and we did a lot of work with the state back then, but it was, it was ISNC. Yeah, the ISNC was like the pre-consolidation time. Um, yeah. Yeah, so basically it's, it's the same thing. You but probably yeah, worked in the mainframe, Scott. Did you work? Hey. <laughs> I, I did a bunch of the, the mainframe gateways for the, the different agencies. Yeah, the mainframe is um, older than most of my interns. It kind of terrifies me. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I got to tell you, when you were talking about hacking into your uh, neighbor's refrigerator. It's not I, hacking if it's unlocked. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right, right. Sure. It's um, not breaking in if the door's unlocked. That's true. That's true. I'm like, um, I'm and I, 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 I've been hearing this, you know, for must be 15 years trying to, to put, you know, refrigerators online. And I'm thinking, why, 
You know, why? Um, you were talking also about the, the thermostats and so oh. forth. And Cisco has a video that they've got called Anatomy of an Attack. And uh, they do a case study where uh, a, a hacker uh, wants to get in and do, you know, s steal some corporate secrets from this company that he can sell to a competitor. And the way he gets in is uh, he he gets in through the thermostat. Yeah. And and it's you know it, it was left with the default password just like you said, and uh, the company had gone through and they'd done an audit and they had cleaned up the network, but they never touched that device. Yep. And so that's, that's how he got a, a, you know, wedged his way in there. So that's what happened with target. They, they pivoted from a, a vendor system uh, that had open access and, and access target that way. Uh, and you can it, just pull up lists of default yes. passwords for devices. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, crazy. It's, you know, as a, a team, um, my team does like what they do. I mean, we're all pretty unabashed nerds. Um, putting us in places and making us wait to have meetings and stuff is usually a, a bad idea because my guys, they get into more ornery mischief, like figuring out what <laughs> is, like we're here as guests. You do not need to do an assessment on their security. We're, I mean, they invite <laughs> a reason. They know there's issues. Let's, you know, please <laughs> don't, don't bring your laptops, get off your phone, quit whatever you're doing. Um, I mean, we had an issue. I say we, my neighborhood had an issue where one particular neighbor had their, uh, you know, in this day and age, they didn't have secured internet. Their Wi-Fi was available. And yeah. I lived I live on the west side of Charleston, so the you know the local crackheads were standing out in front of the houses using her Wi-Fi, and uh, I mean somebody was kind enough to log into her system, lock it down for, her, and even print out instructions on how to connect her device back to it, and she still did. <laughs> um, so you know some people just can't learn. <laughs> but wow. Yeah. yeah, it is. It is fun. The the thermostats, the HVACs, big businesses. That's always the one that's almost a given. Um, it completely shocks me. Uh, that was yeah. one of the first things in the vulnerability program. Uh, yeah, my, my guy was like, "Okay, I guess I'm hitting all of the HVAC systems because when we started scanning and we got our team spun up, it was like, oh, yeah, we need to have people go lock these down things." I know we've got a Roomba and it's online, you know, a Roomba vacuum cleaner. I have not seen Roombas. We do have a lot of smart boards, um, which are fairly, fairly new. Uh, what was it the other day? It was like something random. It wasn't a sweeper. I want to say it was a water cooler that was like reporting. Oh, really? Yeah. I'm like, why? Why? Can't you well, just look at the water cooler and tell it's almost empty? I did see online where uh, I guess Keurig is now making theirs online and people are sending out malware that's actually locking down your Keurig uh, as ransomware. So <laughs> if, yeah. if you want, if you want a cup of coffee, you'll have to pay the ransomware, uh, you know, if that ransom. would kill my folks. I mean, they'd be done. I mean, I've got a microwave. I can put my water in there and heat it up and that type of thing. Well, I, I also, I kind of wanted you to maybe if you could expand on the weird struggle that you all have since you, since you are in state government to where you're expected to protect everything, but they give you a whopping 2% funding to go ahead and do it. So I guess yeah. you have to kind of look and see where the most bang for your buck goes and, and asset um, risk, risk, risk analysis, basically. Yeah. So because of that, so that was, that was one of our big issues. Um, the previous CISO, who's now our CTO, Josh, we worked really hard the last two years on getting a act passed. It's called the secure West Virginia act. The legislature actually gave us uh, $4.2 million to get a cyber risk program kicked off. Um, and in that, in that uh, program, it, it includes a GRC tool, which is a government's risk and compliance tool, which basically lets us track 
which assets are actually risky, which assets have really sensitive data that need protected, and also track what are organizations requesting of the system. Like, are they request? We get weird requests that we deny all the time. Like, we would like RDP opened. No, 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 you don't. You, I mean, you can request all you want. It's not <laughs> happening. I mean, you um, can tell the user remote desktop gateway to get around that if need be. Yeah. Don't, don't put 3039 open on the internet. No, thank you. Yeah. Well, I mean, we have that. Like, that's just turned off. But um, so, you know, they're, oh, we don't want to use multi factor on the. Okay. So not only will we document all the requests that get made, and we will document that they were denied, why they were denied. Um, sometimes you do have to provide exemptions that might give you heartburn uh, for the for the business. You know, some decisions do impact life or limb services. Um, you know, I can't necessarily turn off the network when or turn off a VPN to do an emergency patch while all of workforce is handling hundreds of thousands of unemployment claims because COVID. You know, you run into those situations where like, okay, you get a five day exemption and you have to document that. But that cyber risk program is kind of our response to how we deal with that shoestring budget. You know, we've got that lump sum money um, and now we're making part of that program is we could do that procurement for the GRC tool we document all that risk, but it also makes agencies do regular cybersecurity assessments on their systems. Um, so they are constantly having to say, oh yeah, we still have that. Or, oh, you know, we have my favorite. My favorite is the backup necklace. Have you ever heard of a backup necklace? I mean, is that you getting a lanyard that you put your USB drive on, your USB, you know, flash drive on? Um, yeah, yeah, that would be like a series. Uh, imagine like those tribal like tooth necklaces. Oh, Scott walks around oh, yeah. like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Two so, max. No, no, this had like fourteen on it. Um, yeah, I'm, that's not me. And they were all labeled too. Like there was a key on one of the thumb drives. Oh, look at that. There was a key on one of the thumb drives that explained like what was on each thumb drive. Oh my gosh. So you discover that you yes you discover those things when you're doing these assessments, um, and it's it's always very interesting and terrifying. Uh, so well, like the guy that used to walk around with the big huge key ring. Basically, it's the IT equivalent of it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Horrifying, but you discover those things, and so that risk assessment when that we're, that they're required to do will help us identify those, you know those weird one-offs that then we can say, okay, you know, here, let me introduce you to our programmers and let them get you a solution that you uh, can use and not give the entire cybersecurity team harbor or gray hair. So, wow. Yeah, it's been fun. Um, that program, we started it last year. Um, we are, we're working with a vendor. It's been great to work with and um, we should, get that pretty much launched um, beginning of next year. So we're on the pilot stages right now, mapping it all out. Been fun. Wow. Fantastic. Well, um, Scott, do you have any more questions or, or also throw back out there to Twitch or YouTube to ask if anybody else has any more questions here for Daniel Cox? I can't think of anything right now. Well, you, you know, did you know the one thing. Yeah, it was fantastic. One thing I just, it I had in my mind and it hit me just again. Um, you were talking about some incidences that were made public that you all had. Scott yeah. and I love to hear about horror stories. There's horror one in particular stories. that he loves to talk about um, that was in Wired. What was the name of that like multi-global uh, shipping company, Scott? Maersk. Yeah. Yeah, and about how basically they got hit. They got hit with this. Um, Maybe it was a worm, but basically it affected every single one of their domain controllers except for one that was in India. They had it offline. It was Af Africa. Af okay, Africa. The guy had to fly and personally bring that hard drive back to restore the entire network. So without getting into any crazy specifics, have you all ever gotten 
to almost that level? I mean, Michael Bay level, I suppose. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, we've witnessed and not, this is not necessarily our organization, but uh, mm -hmm. there's, there's been instances where maybe one particular person has seen, Oh, my domain controller is not coming up. It's got a weird screen on it. Eh, I'll deal with it in the morning and basically let the ransomware propagate unchecked overnight and came back and wondered why all his computers were locked the next day. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Um, we've had, there's been a, a bunch like, you know, we've had, there's been F wasn't FBI. It was one of the acronym soups. Uh, they had one of their laptops stolen and it had really sensitive information on it. Uh, we always get <laughs> my favorite, you know, the thing that makes me just makes me chuckle are all the gift card scams. Oh yeah. I am surprised in this day and age, like people will complain about their employers, but then all of a sudden their employers are going to buy gift cards and give to the employees and people run out and go bomb. And I'm just like, really? Like you don't you don't stop to question that at all, um, so g gift cards are always ones that crack me up. We've not had anything extraordinary um, for us, which knock on wood, I'd like to keep that way. Um, <laughs> I'd like to keep the job intact. Uh, we I do see laptops occasionally, uh, like show up in Africa or weird places. <laughs> And we have a pretty strict, like, you don't take your laptop or state resources outside the continental U.S. Um, or we turn them off. Well, now with COVID, you have people, like, going to random places. And we had one that, like, popped up in Africa. I'm like, why is the state PC in Africa? How do they even get there? I mean, aren't basically the borders are still pretty much closed for the most part, I would think, right? You no, know, I didn't I didn't ask those type of questions. I was more concerned. <laughs> why do you have my laptop in Africa? Right. Um, yeah. So apparently they were deciding to do mission work. Oh, okay. And yeah, well, I mean, I don't know how you do mission work and you keep your full time job, but um you see a lot more of that right now. Hmm. Um there was one at a fairly local state. They uh, they had a remote work policy, and the employee hired somebody else from China to do their work for them. And then they took another. He, he, out, he outsourced it. So he yeah. outsourced his job. There's an but, onion video yeah. on that where where people outsource to someone in India, and then the person in India outsources to somebody in Afghanistan. And, you know, yeah. in the next three years, one person in Afghanistan is going to be doing ninety seven percent of the the world's work. Basically, it was, yeah, it was, a real, it was a real situation for this organization. They had the employee outsource it to China. They paid like a dollar an hour. So, I mean, something insanely cheap. And this guy took a whole nother job. Oh my goodness! <laughs> and, yeah, and uh, was basically pulling two salaries. Now. We've had in the past, I mean, my office has worked with pr probably every alphabet federal government acronym that you can name of. I mean, we've done everything from Secret Service to FBI. I mean, I just just on a phone call to the FBI this week. Um, we do, we've done things with ICE, um, city, state, uh, police authorities. So yeah, we, we deal with a lot of weird things that we start and then we're like, here, this is well beyond us. You need to go do criminal investigations. I'd like to keep my team out of that. Thank you. Um, so we've uh, been fortunate enough to assist in some arrests um, revolving uh, child pornography or other things like that. Um, just because we do monitor uh, state library PCs and some other public Wi-Fi. So. Yeah, I had read a case study about a guy. Uh, he had an unsecured Wi-Fi, you know, access point, and a the law enforcement burst in on him at oh dark thirty in the morning, you know, 
dragged him out of bed in front of his wife and kids, called him all kinds of nasty names and stuff. And it turned out that somebody had hopped on his, his Wi-Fi and was downloading uh, kitty pornography. And the only, the only way he was able to prove that it wasn't him was, well, first of all, they took all of his equipment and there was nothing on there. And then he was able to show that he actually really wasn't there. He was out of town at the time that, that those um, incidents or downloads had occurred. And so, uh, but it took, still took him like two years to get his equipment back. Oh, I'm surprised he got it back. Um, yeah, we had, so some of our locations, we actually turn the Wi-Fi off now after hours. Uh, we had one particular location that had some fairly sketchy traffic at weird times. And basically we had to send the police like at 2 a.m. to the parking lot of the, a location and <laughs> go deal with that individual and they were uh but yeah we were like what is this how are they getting in at two o'clock and i'm like how far does that wi-fi reach up there because you know it's a, it's when you're dealing with the whole states and you're dealing with things that have been implemented over years and years and years you know did they reduce how far the the wi-fi is reaching or did they yeah. max it out so you find when out you more. want it to reach a long way it won't do it and then when you're trying to cut down on it, it, it just goes, propagates great. Well, you know, we uh, recently helped the Department of Education do their Kids Connect where they put out the 1,000 Wi-Fi's. And those yeah. are beefy Wi-Fi's that are meant to reach out across the parking lots. And I'm still shocked by how far those things reach. Um, really? Yes. <laughs> it's <laughs> terrifying. <laughs> so... I'm like, well, I'm across the street, across the parking lot, and I'm still getting internet access. What the heck? So, yeah, it's pretty cool. Well, Danielle, thank you so much for, for joining us, for talking about the types of opportunities that are here in our very own state and how people can go and get prepared to uh, to, to go into that if they're interested. Um, we really, really appreciate it. I know based on some of the things we've just been talking about, you're talking about fishing. Scott's going to be doing a session uh, tomorrow on fishing. Uh, I keep, I keep thinking probably the best fishing technique that we get people right now would be, um, FedEx. As we get near the holidays, people are expecting packages. If someone sends you one of those FedEx things that says, Hey, your, your FedEx package is was sent back to the place. I think that's the one that could kind of probably more realistically, in my opinion, get people than a gift card, maybe. Cause they'd be like, we I need that package for Christmas. We actually fish our employees. We have a, mm -hmm. we have a, we fish ours on a regular basis. Uh, if you can ever, if you're ever doing fishing campaigns with permission to the organization you work for. Uh, oh, of course. Yeah. Anything that would take away money or rights to your employees, people will click on it so fast. We inadvertently hit a sore spot once when we were like, we're going to make you a parking. The cost to park at the Capitol is going to increase from $20 a month to $35. I mean, we had, we targeted one agency. Like we only target a certain percentage of each agency. So we don't overwhelm um, responses and <laughs> the entire agency ended up going to the link because people were so mad. They forwarded it to others wow. that didn't get it. Yeah, have you seen this thing? Oh my gosh. And but, I was like, uh, I'm so was, sorry. I did not, I did not, we did not think that would uh, escalate that quickly. <laughs> they were doing the propagation work for you. Well, you yeah. know, the guy that did it, he's like, he's like, I only targeted two people out of that agency. Why, why do I have 85 people going there? I think uh, they call those super spreaders these days. I think that's yes. what, what we could yeah. call that in the, uh, in the fishing world. I only had I only known that term last year when we did that. Yeah, yeah. it was great fun. Yeah, My fishing guy has way too much fun. Yeah. <laughs> well, yes. Thank you that very was a good much. One, though. Yeah. Yes, very very good one. Thank you for the stories. Thank you for your expertise and your insight. We really appreciate it. I, I appreciate being here. Thanks, Danielle. Anybody, everyone has any questions, you can reach out to to me or my office and. Uh, if anybody has students or wants to do like um, a day in the life, we've we've been figuring out how to do like virtual tours of the, the security operations center. So just give me a call. Oh, that'd be great. 
That'd be fantastic. I might get with you, get with you with that when I do uh, cybersecurity ops. Yep. Yep. We have some presentations and uh, the guys have fake data that they can pull up in their tools so you can see the actual tools and stuff. Oh, that, that would be great. Yep. I might get with you in the spring. All right. We'll, we'll probably still be here. I'll probably still be downstairs in my basement. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Thanks a lot. Okay. Have a great day. Thanks. You, you too. too.